welcome. Welcome to our webinar uh, dedicated to the pathway to carbon net zero in the tourism industry. Uh, it is a pleasure to see everyone of you here today uh, as we embark on this pivotal discussion about sustainability and environmental responsibility in one of the world's most influential sectors, the tourism sector. I am Chiara, uh, Chiara Costone, International Green Tree Coordinator, and I have the pleasure to moderate the first webinar of the FEE's annual campaign dedicated to climate action. Uh, in 2022, uh, here at FEE, we released uh, our 10-year strategic plan called Gaia 2030 with three critical goals in mind. To empower climate action, reduce environmental pollution, and protect global biodiversity. In 2022, we have dedicated our campaign to the protection of global biodiversity, and in 2023, to the reduction of environmental pollution. And this year, Green Tea and Blue Flag uh, are excited to run the new climate action campaign with three objectives in mind, increasing knowledge about climate change, uh, supporting action for climate resiliency, and accelerating the transition to climate neutrality. All the details about the campaign can be found at the link we have shared in the chat. So let's inaugurate the new climate action campaign with today's webinar dedicated to the path to carbon net zero. Uh, with us today, our speakers, Christopher Impson, uh, World Travel and Tourism Council, Vice President of Research and Sustainability. Hi, Christopher. And then Claudia Bogenspega, Green Key International Coordinator and Project Manager, and Alessandro Venti, Blue Flag International Coordinator. So before we delve into the intricacies of our topic, let's take a moment to understand what we mean uh, by the pathway to net zero. Well, the pathway to net zero represents a comprehensive approach to addressing the global climate crisis. At its core, it involves balancing the amount of greenhouse gases emitted into the atmosphere with the amounts removed, ultimately achieving a state where our carbon footprint is neutral. Now, as we turn our focus to the tourism industry, it is essential to acknowledge its significant impact on the environment. From air travel, accommodation, local transportation and recreational activities, tourism can leave a substantial carbon footprint. However, it also presents an incredible opportunity for positive change. And by embracing sustainable practices and adopting a pathway to net zero, the tourism industry can really become a catalyst for environmental stewardship and conservation. Today, with the precious contribution of our speakers, we will focus on the impact of the tourism industry and identify relevant data, a basic roadmap and benchmark towards achieving net zero for your business, share resources and good practices from our drinking network to inspire you, and then explore also different paths and possibilities for climate monitoring and emission reduction and removal for beaches and marinas, thanks to the contribution of the Blue Flag team. I urge each of you to actively participate in our discussion, ask questions, share your insights. This is very important to us. And before I leave the floor to Christopher, I just uh, would like to go through our house rules. So this webinar is being recorded. Okay, if you'd like to stay anonymous, please change your name uh, and close your camera. The recording will be uploaded to the Green Key at Blue Flag International YouTube channel. And if you have any questions, please write it uh, in the chat. Uh, we are gonna have a Q&A session at the end. And if you have any questions after the webinar, just please email us um, at um, greenkey.global. And now, without further ado, I would like to give the floor to our first speaker, Christopher Inson. Thank you very much. And uh, good morning and afternoon. And evening to everyone. I saw from the chat here that we really do have people from all over the globe. So that's very exciting, all interested in this very important topic. It's, it's a real pleasure to be invited to this event with our dear partner, Green Key, 
with whom I'm actually working pretty much on a daily basis at this stage, but I'll talk a little bit more about that later. Today, we're here to explore pathways to net zero for our sector, which is a topic which uh, seems to have everyone scratching their heads these days. And what I won't be offering the definitive answer on this challenge, though I'm working on it, uh, I do look forward to a rich discussion and hopefully many questions and, and debates afterwards. Next, please. So for today's presentation, I will start with some context on the World Travel and Tourism Council, WTTC. I will then talk you through some of our groundbreaking new data, which we are convinced will serve as a foundation for evidence-based action moving forward. And I will then look at some of the tools that we've developed to support the sector's net zero transition, including our net zero roadmap for travel and tourism and our hotel sustainability basics initiative on which we're working closely with GreenKey. Next. So a bit of background on WTTC, just to help set the scene here. WTTC is the body representing the global travel and tourism privacy. And the story goes that 30 years ago, these four gentlemen here, the CEOs of Amex, of Marriott, of British Airways, and American Airlines, met with the former US Secretary of State, Henry Kissinger, to impress upon him the importance of our sector and the need for more support. And Kissinger, in his wisdom, said, well, this is great, but you should come back to me once you've got a unified story backed by evidence. And these were men of action, so that's what they did. They, they went off and they formed WTTC, precisely with that goal in mind, to unify the sector around common priorities and with evidence. And that's what WTTC has been doing ever since. Next, please. And we are probably most known for our economic impact data, showing that tourism contribution to GDP, to tourism employment and, and visitor spend. Um, our latest data for 2023, for example, shows that the sector generated almost 10 trillion US dollars in GDP and 330 million jobs both well over 20% above the 2022 results. It also showed that international visitor spend is rebounding even faster, increasing by 33% to 1.63 trillion uh, US dollars in 2023. So clearly this is not a sector to be ignored. And whilst we're very happy with recovery and with growth, is this also brings with it the important responsibility of growing sustainably. Next. And indeed, our members, who are the CEOs and presidents of over 200 of the largest companies in travel and tourism, have, have made it clear to us that times have changed. And purely measuring economic impact is not good enough any longer, right? but not good enough. We need to have a more holistic understanding of our impact. So with our partner, Oxford Economics, and, and with support of Saudi Arabia, we have worked to expand our economic impact reporting to include the environmental and social footprints of tourism, and also to track our sector's progress toward the, towards the SDGs. And now we have data covering greenhouse gas emissions, energy use and composition, pollutants, water use, material extraction, and also social elements like the age, wage, and gender profiles of employment. So essentially, what our data does is it tells you for every dollar that travel and tourism generates in the economy, what was its corresponding footprint? across these indicators here. And we have this data across 185 countries uh, addressing both direct and indirect impacts and across the subsectors that make up tourism. And for today's presentation, I will touch briefly on greenhouse gases and energy use as these are the most relevant indicators in a net zero context. Next. So the headline figure of our data is obviously travel and tourism's contribution to global greenhouse gas emissions. And in 2019, at its peak, the sector generated 8.1% of total global emissions, up from 7.2% in 2010. Now, this number is in and of itself neither positive nor negative. The sector's greenhouse gas footprint globally and nationally is essentially a reflection of its economic. So it's no surprise that travel and tourism's emissions fell precipitously during COVID, when our sector was disproportionately affected to other sectors, as you can see here in this graph. We also separate our emissions into scopes one, two, and three, and also international transport. And roughly speaking, scope one are emissions from tourism operations that directly serve tourists. Scope two are emissions from purchase electricity or utilities. And scope three are your tourism value chain emissions. And so the dark blue line here represents scope one emissions, 
and the light blue line represents our combined scope two and three emissions. And so we can see here that scopes two and three account actually for the majority of travel and tourism's emissions. Next, please. It's also important to look at your, to your emissions intensity to get an idea of your environmental performance. And we describe intensity as the kilograms of greenhouse gas emissions released per dollar of GDP that our sector generates. And the good news is that our emissions intensity is dropping. So in 2021, for every dollar that uh, travel and tourism generated, 0.48 kilos of greenhouse gas emissions were released. And this is down from 0.62 kilos in 2010. And we see the same trend for every region across the world and across 135 of the 185 economies that we monitor. And indeed, between 2010 and 2019, our sector's average annual GDP growth was 4.3%, whilst our emissions growth was 2.5%. And so we can safely say that our growth is being decoupled from our emissions. However, even with declining emissions intensity, your absolute emissions can still increase if your tourism sector is growing. So what we should be aiming for is a decrease in absolute emissions. And in this regard, we saw this happen in 15 countries between 2010 and 2019, that their absolute emissions fell despite a growth in their, their tourism sector. And so these are the types of cases that we want to dive into going forward, to see what lessons can be learned. Next. VSR also allows us to break down travel and tourism's emissions among the subsectors that it comprises. And we can see here that the sector's emissions reflect its diverse mix of activities. But unsurprisingly, transport is the largest contributor, both globally and within every world region. We are, after all, the business of moving people from one place to another. And in 2019, transport accounted for 40% of sector's emissions. We can also see that the second largest contributor is utilities. So essentially your scope two emissions, accounting for a fifth of our overall emissions. And this suggests that the key levers for decarbonizing uh, travel and tourism are to decarbonize transport, be it electric vehicles or sustainable fuels or green hydrogen and so on, and to move towards renewable energy on our grid. Next, please. Now, very closely linked to travel and tourism's emissions is also the amount and type of energy that the sector uses. Our data tracks the use of coal, oil, natural gas, renewables, hydro, nuclear, biofuels, and waste. And globally, when direct supply chain and international transport are included, the sector contributed to 10.6% of the world's overall energy use. Next, please. Now, it's worth noting that the sector's energy use is relatively higher than its 8.1% contribution to greenhouse gas emissions. And this is primarily because travel and tourism, due to the importance of transport that we spoke about before, uses relatively more oil than other sectors, but relatively less coal. And coal is more carbon intensive than oil. So 61% of our sector's energy is derived from oil compared to 28% for the overall economy but only 15% of our energy needs are met by coal, compared to 32% for the rest of the economy. So next. But of course, those are both fossil fuels. What we really want to see is that our sector wheels, weans itself off of fossil fuels and starts using low carbon sources of energy and especially renewables. And so from 2010 until 2021, we have seen a slight increase in the use of low carbon energy from 5.1% to 6.4%, uh, here shown in green. But this certainly is not fast enough. And so here there are perhaps lessons to be drawn from countries that have performed well. For example, in our analysis, uh, we see that the fastest increase during in this period and by a stretch was actually in Kenya, whose low carbon use grew by almost 12%, owing to a substantial growth in its renewable electricity capacity and almost 90% of Kenya's electricity generation now comes from renewables. So that, uh, this has been a critical component of them performing well on this front. Next slide, please. Now, I'll have to let you explore our other environmental and social data sets, which include 
water, uh, variety of pollutants, material extraction, as well as social components like the age, wage, and gender composition of tourism employment. It's all on our website. You can dive into it on our dedicated microsite. You can either use this link here or, or the QR code, and I'll just leave that for a couple more seconds if any of you are noting it down. But yes, this is free for everyone to use. Right, next slide, please. Now, of course, data is helpful for understanding what's going on and, and taking some top level decisions, but we need action too. We need to support action. And for this reason, WPCC creates the first ever net zero roadmap for the entire travel and tourism sector. And the roadmap covers five key verticals. So aviation, cruise, OTAs, so your online travel agents, tour operators, uh, and hotels. And it provides a status quo of climate action in the sector. It examines the decarbonization hurdles, hurdles and levers for each of these industries, and then sets ambition corridors depending on the type of business that you are. So business in an easy to abate sector might have a stronger ambition corridor, for example, than a business in a hard to abate sector, like transport. And finally, the roadmap ends with a call to action for businesses and to governments, you know, demanding appropriate support from governments. Next slide. Now, I know that many of us here today are from the accommodation sector, so I just wanted to give you a flavor of some of our accommodation findings. First, we looked at the emissions profile of accommodation, which showed clearly that the majority of emissions lie in scope two, so that's 37% in scope two, and scope three with 55%. Now, scope uh, two would be your energy consumption for lighting, in-house laundry, heating, and cooling, whereas scope three would be, for example, your, your food and beverage supply and production, your external laundry services, and staff travel, and so on. We then also looked at some of the key challenges, which included defining your emissions boundaries. In other words, what emissions are you actually responsible for? And this is especially a challenge we found in scope three. It also, uh, the, the challenges also included the dependence on existing infrastructure and energy grids. So in other words, there are many levers that kind of are a bit out of your hands. You know, you need uh, support, external support to, 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 to make improvements on these fronts. And it also included complicated ownership structures and the corresponding responsibilities. And finally, based on these findings, we provide a, a roadmap with key levers, which as you can see here on, on, on the right, include energy efficiency and operational improvements, sustainable procurement, and, and so on. And we go into a, a fair bit more detail in, in the roadmap, and I also think that Claudia will talk more in depth about this, so I'll leave that to her. And again, I encourage you to read this document, if of interest, of course. Next slide, please. Now, roadmaps are great, but one thing that keeps on popping up is that getting started is the hardest thing especially for businesses that are basically just getting by from day to day. And so for this reason, we have developed the Hotel Sustainability Basics. Now, the idea for the basics emerged as a result of a clear demand from a significant group of global hotel brands to develop sustainability criteria by the industry or the industry to encourage all businesses in hospitality to begin their sustainability journeys. WTTC was asked to coordinate this initiative and to develop the criteria, and to do so, we carried out extensive consultations with over 60 global hotel brands and, and relevant industry bodies. And in the end, we got there. We juggled hundreds of criteria, but managed to boil it down to 12 fundamental, globally aligned sustainability criteria that all hotels can and should be doing as a bare minimum. And that also serve as a stepping stone to more complex schemes, such as those provided by Green Key. And indeed, Green Key, together with G uh, SGS, are the verifiers for the basics, our trusted partners, and yeah, I'll add, it's a real pleasure to work with our colleagues at Green Key. Now, the verification is simple and affordable. It's remote desktop and so that everyone can join this movement. Basically, there is no excuse if you haven't started already. We now have uh, two and a half thousand hotels verified in over 70 countries across the globe. Next slide, please. As you can see here, uh, this is our ever-growing list of partners covering hotel groups, destinations, associations, and platforms. Please do join this movement uh, either by getting verified, but if you already have verification certification or if you want something else, that's great. But then at least share this information with your own contacts who might not have started their sustainability journeys. Because basically it helps us all raise the bottom of sustainability in, in hospitality. And final slide, please. 
this is the last slide, as I, I think I've probably already taken up too much of your time. I have focused on, on climate primarily in the last 20 minutes, but we do work on all facets of sustainability and have a whole bunch of tools and resources that are free for everyone to download and use, uh, ranging from how to reduce single-use plastics to uh, roadmaps for water and how to be nature positive. Actually, you'll, you'll see that all of these are also related to tourism and plastics and uh, not traveling tourism, rather the, the climate. I mean, it contributes to, to climate change. Uh, you need nature to soak up carbon and climate affects nature. Uh, water is affected by climate as well. They're, they're all very interlinked, so it would be a mistake to be myopic, let's say, in your approach. We also have a report uh, on the complex world of ESG reporting and identifying what applies to you and how ready you are. We also have at a destination level various pieces on how to ensure a better governance for our tech. So it comes out there, uh, this is a non-exhaustive selection of the reports. Again, see this up for a second longer because there is a QR code accessible do have a look and with that thank you very much thank you thank, thank you, you christopher thank you for this insightful presentation i think uh the the most important points were emerging from your presentation are the power of data no the importance of data driven action and what we can realize by analyzing all this data that we collect from our industry and then the importance also of sustainability verification and certification schemes uh, working together with the industry, with the business for a, a more sustainable future. And I think that now with my colleague, Claudia Bodecberga, we are gonna also uh, dive on uh, the green keywords more and see what our network uh, can offer. So Claudia, I will leave you the word. Thank you, Chiara, so much for the introduction. And um, I think in the background there is uh, someone sharing my screen. <laughs> um, we can't see it yet. No. Um, thank you so much. So um, it's a pleasure also from my side um, to be here today. My name is Claudia Bogensberger, as it has been mentioned already by my colleague Chiara. We can see the screen now. Thank you, Finn. Um, so before I, I will be talking, as mentioned by Chiara, about the path to net zero by using examples from our network of Green Key certified establishments. Um, before I go into detail with that, next slide, please. I would like to explain a little bit who we are um, for those of you who don't know. Green Key, we are the leading international certifica certification programs for tourism establishments worldwide. Right now, we have more than a bit more than 5,000 establishments in more than 60 countries certified. And we generally certify um, six types of categories. The most common one that we operate with are hotels and hostels, but we also certify restaurants, campsites and holiday parks, attractions such as museums, conference centers and small accommodations. So we really operate with the whole spectrum of the tourism industry. There's, of course, always room for more. And um, a little bit of background, the entity behind Green Key is the Foundation for Environmental Education, in short, FEE. Um, FEE is, um, as the name says, an, an, uh, an organization focusing on um, empowering individuals and organization through the help of education about the environment. So besides the Green Key program, we have another program in the tourism sector, Blue Flag. Our colleagues are here with us today, so they're going to talk more about that program. And we have three additional programs really focusing on the next generation, working together with schools and youth um, and empower them through education. And finally, we also have a program called the Global Forest Fund, but I'm going to come back to that later again. So next slide, please. Um, I would like to um, start this presentation by reminding us all what is actually net zero. What are we talking about? So UN Tourism, the former UNWTO, defines net zero as the target for all emission reduction efforts. So it involves on the one hand reducing the production of greenhouse gas emissions to as near as zero as possible. And on the other hand, to remove all remaining emissions from the atmosphere. Next, please. 
So that's a really long um, definition. I tried to pick out the most important elements. And you will hear these two words throughout my presentation. On the one hand, we're talking about reduction. We need to make sure that we reduce the greenhouse gas emissions that we're producing as a tourism establishment as close to zero as possible. But it will be hard to completely reduce them because we are operating, right? We are a business after all. So for the rest of the emission, the idea is to remove the remaining emissions from the atmosphere. Next slide, please. So we from Green Key, um, I would like now like to um, start talking about how do you actually start your path to net zero. We from Green Key work together with several partners such as the WTTC um, or the Sustainable Hospitality Alliance. The Sustainable Hospitality Alliance um, has also developed um, a roadmap, a path to net zero hospitality. Based on their roadmap, the first step would be to measure and mitigate negative impacts. Um, one of the elements for the first step that you can, um, you can look into is the just presented hotel sustainability basics by Christopher. So that can help you to actually start your process if you haven't already. The second step based on Sustainable Hospitality Alliance in short SHA would be to minimize your negative impacts and initiative positive impacts. So again, those two first steps are looking at the reduction part. Um, next one, please. Um, the third step would then be to neutralize your negative impacts and build a robust positive impact system. And finally, the fourth step um, will be to give back more than you take. So as you can see, we have again the, the two first steps focusing on the reduction and the second, um, the last two steps looking at the removal. Next slide, please. So now I would like to go into detail um, uh, of these two topics. First of all, reduction. There is four areas where you as a tourism establishment can, can reduce carbon emissions. It's um, by looking into sustainable purchasing, by looking into waste minimization, water conservation, and energy efficiency. And I would like to now um, guide you through these different areas by giving examples from our network. Because the idea is that after this net, that after this webinar, you hopefully have a few little perks, tips and tricks and, and actions at your hand that you have written down that you can take home and implement in your establishment. Next slide, please. So the first example that I have with me today is related to sustainable purchasing. One of our certified establishments in Turkey, the hotel number 11, had an unused terrace um, on, um, on their hotel's roof in the middle of uh, Istanbul. And um, they have transformed this unused terrace into a community garden. So thereby they have created a green oasis in the middle of the city, and they haven't just um, used uh, this uh, space for their establishment and their guests by themselves, but they also use this space to, to educate about the topic of sustainable agriculture. They are organizing events and very important, we're talking about sustainable purchasing. What would be more sustainable than making your own vegetables and herbs and fruits for the breakfast buffet of the hotel? Um, the next example that I have with me um, is I have actually two examples here. Uh, one's back, please, thank you. Um, basically, the one hand on the right hand side, you can see a picture of the Bank Hotel in the Netherlands. There on the one hand, um, they have turned around their menu and um, they're offering 100% vegetarian um, menus with the option to add um, meat or, or fish um, uh, products if someone would like to. So they have turned it a little bit around and thereby are also looking more into sustainability. And um, a small anecdote, um, as you can see on the right side of the picture, the hotel has been actually a former church. Um, and instead of throwing out all the old hotel benches, they decided to use the benches to create this uh, really nice looking designer wall, I would say. And um, instead, they didn't have to buy new resources, they refurbished the material. And behind this wall, you can actually find the rooms. 
And the second example here that you can see is the Hotel Hebron in uh, Denmark. Um, as you can see, they are uh, working together with locals. They're informing the tourists about where do the products come from um, exactly within the 100 kilometer radius of their hotel. Um, so they're also, again, educating and involving the tourists and at the same time working together with local producers. Next slide, please. Um, looking at waste minimization, of course, there is a lot of opportunities. I would like to focus on the two major waste streams in the tourism and hospitality se sector, which is on the one hand single use plastic and on the other hand food waste. So in terms of single use plastic, uh, plastic our hotel, um, our certified hotel in the Seychelles, the Story Resort, they, on the one hand, they have eliminated all uh, single-use plastic. Instead, they're using bulk dispensers. All materials are from natural ingredients or wood, um, bamboo or paper, for example, for their straws. And at the same time, they have also eliminated all printed material. Um, instead, all the guest information is now available via the QR codes that you can see um, engraved on recycled wood throughout the resort. Um, next, please. Um, then another great initiative um, that I brought today is from Curaçao, from um, the Lion's Dive Beach Resort. They have actually implemented a bottle refill program. So every guest that arrives at the resort gets this uh, bottle and they can refill water throughout the resort. And the island of Curaçao, I have heard, they actually brought it a little bit further and now there's the possibility to refill water throughout the island. So they managed to actually cooperate together and make it even bigger the impact. Next, uh, two clicks, please. Um, I have two more examples, which are a little bit more obvious, I would say. Um, on the one hand, you can see a very informative recycling container in um, one of our resorts, certified resorts in Suriname. So it's again, the idea about involving um, the tourists in the process. And um, finally, in terms of food waste, before you can actually implement the right actions and i'm getting back to that as well it is important that you start tracking you need to understand when and where do you have the most um waste and uh, for example food waste and for example the winnow system as you can see from our hot uh, one of our hotels in finland can help you with that it's a system that basically tracks how much waste you're producing during which times and then you can actually use that waste and for example transform it into biodiesel um next slide um, when it comes to energy efficiency and emission reduction, I want to refer back to what Chris has been talking about. On the one hand, um, scope one, as mentioned, is really from your owned or controlled sources. Um, so the Hotel Jakarta in the Netherlands, um, they managed to create a completely energy neutral building. As you can see on the top of the picture, the, the windows on the one hand are solar panels, but at the same time, they are automatically open based on the room temperature inside. So it's a really advanced system. I got to visit the hotel. They at the same time have this massive, beautiful garden in the lobby of the hotel, um, which one would think that requires a lot of water. But what they do is they use treated waste water and rainwater to um, water those plants. The second example that I have here is related to scope two. Um, which is, again, um, from the generation of purchased electricity. Next, please. So what would be the best way to reduce your purchased electricity? Of course, redu um, producing your own electricity, right? So again, the example from the Lion's Dive Beach Resort, they have a lot of sun in Curaçao, luckily. So what they did is they used the roof of their hotel and created solar panels. The aim is to increase that even more and... Um, they use it for, of course, uh, the energy in the hotel, but they also use it for a charging station for electric cars that is offered to the guests. So it's, again, a very holistic thought concept here. Next slide, please. Um, Finally, water conservation, um, looking at scope-free emissions, so all the additional um, 
uh, indirect emissions. I have an example from the fishermen's cove resort in the Seychelles. They have really looked at different areas on how to conserve water. On the one hand, they have two boreholes um, where they um, get water from, which is then reused for guest bedroom and the laundry. They also have um, pressure sensors on water pipes to be able to react quickly to, to leaks and many more initiatives. Um, next slide, please. Um, but very important from us at the Foundation in, for Environmental Education. In the end, we will conserve only what we love. We will love only what we understand and we will understand only what we are taught. Next slide, please. Why, why did I bring this quote? Because in the end, um, there is only a certain amount of greenhouse gas emissions that you're able to reduce um, without the help of involving your employees, of involving the communities. So the import, another important factor is that you invest in human capital through sustainability training and development. Again, two examples here. The stories, um, Seychelles and Fisherman's Cove resorts, they regularly organize beach cleanups with students from local schools in the community. Um, and another one is the Redison Hotel Madagascar. Actually, um, the Redison Hotel Group has been a long-term partner from uh, Green Key as well. And we are involved in several projects together, such as also the, the Hotel Sustainability Basics. And the Redison Hotels in Madagascar, they have created the Community Action Month, where they really focus on um, involving local suppliers, as you can see on the picture. Um, they are organizing cleanups, they are planting trees, and many more um, actions throughout the month. Um, so thank you so much. Next slide. Now I have brought already a lot of examples from our networks and um, I would like to refer back to the challenges that have been mentioned by Christopher before. So we understand, of course, from Green Key, we're working with many um, hotel chains, but also small and medium sized enterprises. And we totally understand that at the beginning of a journey, it can be very challenging to understand how do I get started? And W2DC in their roadmap to net zero, um, they have identified some of the major challenges that are actually experienced by tourism and hospitality um, establishments. I don't want to focus on the challenges now. I would like to uh, focus on the solutions and opportunities. Um, so next slide, please. Uh, or next click, sorry. The first challenge, um, that uh, I would like to highlight is that very often um, establishments, hotels have difficulties with defining long-term net zero targets. We from Green Key, it's actually part of our criteria that you implement actions um, on a yearly basis um, and you, you're also required to reflect on actions. So you can see the Green Key criteria also as a roadmap, basically, um, because every year you, the idea is for every sustainability journey that you don't do it one time and never touch it again. The idea is that you develop, right? Um, next click, please. Um, the second challenge um, that I would like to highlight is that uh, establishments mentioned that there is limited dedication of team and lack of support from leadership. I actually, before this presentation, I talked to some of our Green Key certified hotels and I got a very positive response from one of them that said on their island where they're based, actually the fact that they focus on sustainability and they're Green Key certified um, makes them the preferred employer in hospitality because the next generation, the youth cares. And um, they have gotten back to it that it makes, makes them their favorite hotel and the place to be. Um, next click. And finally, we also from Green Key know that the process of working towards a common goal creates a bond in the team. It's a shared vision that everyone works together on. Next, please. Um, the next challenge that I'm focusing on is um, uh, the limited willingness to pay for sustainable products. We hear that sometimes from our, our hotels that maybe some of the customers are not willing to pay for. However, Green Key establishments report back to us that they have rather the opposite experience that many of the travelers report back to them saying that they preferably stayed with them because of their focus on sustainability. Next one, please. 
Then um, affordability of available technologies. We understand that it, it's, at first it seems like um, it could be expensive to start with the sustainability journey. However, again, we got some feedback from the hotels that very often the return on investment is forgotten. Um, if you save resources such as energy, water, waste, you of course save, um, um, save money as well. And one of our hotels said that they invested in a water filter installation, which was paid back in less than a year. So it's really incredible numbers that we receive here as well. And finally, the next, uh, the last solution that I'm focusing on is that one of the challenges identified is the inconsistency of carbon metrics and methodologies for reporting. So again, there is a lot of tools as presented by Christopher. There's a lot of resources already out there. We from Green Key also have a hotel carbon and measurement initiative that is focused on um, a carbon calculation tool that has been developed by SHA. And we also have database benchmarking. So we are also there to help basically. Um, next slide, please. Um, so now I talked a lot about reduction and um, the reduction part is of course the biggest part because first of all, you need to make sure that you get down to zero as possible. But now um, a few more slides about the removal part. There is a lot of developments out in the market um, in terms of research for how to best remove um, carbon, uh, a greenhouse gas emission out of our atmosphere. Um, I want to focus on two elements that are, in my opinion, the most implementable for any hotel, for any small enterprise. That's on the one hand, afforestation and reforestation, and on the other hand, ocean fertilization. Next slide, please. So um, in short, next click, please. Healthy oceans and healthy forests. That was, that's what we need to focus on because our oceans and forests are natural carbon sinks. Next slide. So our one of our hotels in the Maldives, for example, they invested in um, a self-driven initiative to preserve and rehabilitate coral reef ecosystem. Um, the aim is to protect the reefs, but also to educate and motivate. And now I'm getting back to something that I mentioned at the beginning. We from Free Fee offer the Global Forest Fund, which is a carbon compensation initiative um, that allows individuals, but also businesses to reduce their carbon footprint. We basically, all the money that is being donated to the Global Forest Fund is used for um, uh, projects, uh, reforestation projects, where we involve um, communities, um, thereby creating a sense of ownership, which then again creates um, the feeling of the need to protect the trees in that specific area, um, affecting in a long-term impact, basically. So we have already um, invested more than 80,000 US dollars in environmental education and tree planting projects all over the world. So if you're interested in that, um, visit globalforestfund.global um, or we're also here for questions. Um, next slide, please. Now I'm coming to my last two slides. How can we from Green Key and Fee help? First of all, hopefully from my presentation, you saw that we have um, a lot of guidance. We have a framework for you. We have tools and resources available, carbon, like the <laughs> carbon calculation tool, like these free webinars that we give um, every once in a while and trainings that we provide. And finally, if you become a Green Key certified establishment, you also receive access to our good practice database. You can get inspired by all our establishments out there. And uh, that brings me to my last slide. What are the key learnings for you? I know I have talked a lot now, um, but what can you take home? Um, first of all, you need to start, um, if, you, if you want, of course, the first step would be to identify emission intensive areas in your operations. And once you do that, set realistic targets. The second step would be to implement resource saving procedures to switch to renewable resources and identify possibility to create negative emissions. That's the removal part that I was talking about. The third um, step would be to reskill your whole team and cre uh, create a sustainable value chain. So, so also involve your suppliers in the process. And finally, um, sustainability is a holistic process. Everyone needs to be involved. So also involve your customers, your staff, and any other stakeholders in the process. And that's it from my side.
Um, you can, can contact us for any questions you have. And thank you so much. Back to you, Chiara. Thank you, Claudia. Thank you. That was amazing. Basically, you helped us navigating such a intricate topic. Uh, thanks to the help of our amazing good practices from our network. You know, here at Green Key, um, we have the privilege of working with uh, motivated establishments and we want to represent them. We want to share their stories. And that is why this year, for example, we are uh, promoting their good practices on our website. I uh, left a link in the chat. Please, if you are being key certified establishments and would like to be featured in our news, would like to share with the network your story, please contact us. And um, now uh, is the moment of the Blue Flag team. So looking forward to hearing more about Marina. Thank you, Carol. Let me share my screen. Can you help me put it uh, full screen? Let's see, I will share that. Let me explain the document and put the PowerPoint. One second. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay, and the screen. Uh, can you all see my full screen now? Super. Thank you, Chiara. And wow, honestly, it's very difficult to hold a presentation after Claudia and Christopher. And they set the bar very, very high. So uh, you will have to bear with me and I will try to um, spin the topic from a different angle. This time uh, we also talk about tourism, but we will see uh, the angle of uh, tourist destinations with water-related tourism. So I'm going to talk about beaches, marinas, and tourist boats. I am Alessandro Venti. I am Blue Flag International Coordinator, also at the Foundation for Environmental Education. And first of all, I would really like to uh, thank everyone uh, for being here with us today, because I'm so excited to have so many participants and to share our experience and see um, so Blue Flag International is one of the programs uh, that FE runs. Uh, we work with beaches, marinas, and tourist boats, and we award them based on a series of criteria on environmental education, water quality, environmental management, safety, accessibility. Um, we have a network uh, that is uh, representing more than 5,000 sites all over the world in more than 50 countries. We've been around since more or less uh, 1987. And uh, to be honest, it's been a blast working with uh, Blue Flag International because it's, it's uh, such a collection of experience from national operators all over the world running the program, uh, site managers putting a lot of effort, a lot of energy, a lot of incredible work to really um, accelerate this transition to um, climate neutrality, as we were mentioning before. So it's really a learning process that I'm so excited to be here to share some of the stories from the network with you uh, that are so inspiring to me. And I really hope I can convey at least 10% of how cool these stories are. Um, so I will start from a little bit of an international context here uh, because this is how I do. Uh, that's also my background. I studied international diplomatic sciences in my bachelor. So I really want to start from the United Nations uh, Framework Convention on Climate Change that you might know. Uh, it's started in Rio and the signatories are the governments that are the parties of this convention and they meet every year in the conference of the parties, COPs, right? Um, there is a particularly relevant COP that you might have heard of. The Paris Agreements are the result of this one, COP21 in 2015. And uh, I collected in the slides some of the points that I think are really interesting and that I will touch upon in my presentation. And then I think also uh, Claudia and Christopher touched upon in theirs. Um, so we have a long-term temperature goal to really try to contain this global warming uh, phenomenon that is threatening in a way our livelihoods and um, that is becoming something that is of the present, really, not, not a problem of the future. We are trying to keep the temperature increase below uh, 2 degrees Celsius and as much as possible below 1.5 degrees. Uh, for this, we are trying to reach a, a situation of climate neutrality 
uh, that Claudia clearly explained before. Uh, so this net zero that is kind of giving the name to our presentation and our webinar today. Uh, in order to do this, we need to really start thinking of uh, measures that include that are included in the mitigation strategy, that is reducing, removing um, GHG, uh, so that would be greenhouse gases. One of the um, mainly known ones is CO2, of course, but there are a number of them. And uh, all the signatories of this, uh, this um, Paris Agreement have to come up with nationally determined contributions, that is, some sort of climate action plans to kind of um, understand how they will act and reach this climate neutrality gradually. Uh, there is a strong role for the announcement of sinks and reservoirs for carbon removal, as Claudia was mentioning before. And this is a mix of natural and artificial solutions to withdraw the carbon and GHG from the atmosphere and uh, imprison them in a way in, in uh, organic mass or in some sinks. And I would really like to spend a moment to mention how important climate change education is, because in the end, uh, we are the foundation for environmental education. This is at the core of our DNA as an organization. And this is some sort of free requirements for climate action, if you will, because um, as Claudia was uh, beautifully mentioning before with a quote, uh, we really need to understand what the problem is, what the problem entails, how it threatens us in order for us to design strategies and implement some actions to address it. So from the international context, I would like to show a little bit about the national uh, determined contributions that we mentioned before. This is the situation right now. So this is data that we have from the report um, uh, from 2023 about how we are doing with these national determined contributions. So as you can see, uh, we have a net improvement uh, compared to the situation before the Paris Agreement, but still uh, these projections that come from these national plans that I was mentioning before, uh, these estimates of how we will do in terms of the uh, greenhouse gas emissions are not sufficient, it would seem, from, from the graph to stay below the, um, the two degrees Celsius increase in temperature. Um, so we, I, I really want to um, share with you the sense of urgency that we need to deal with here because climate change is not something that we can call a problem of the future or a problem of future generations, but it is something that is so um, present, really, that we need to start thinking of solutions right now. Um, Claudia and Christopher already shared some of the definitions. This is the common language, I would say, that we need to have all together. So Claudia was mentioning uh, the definitions from UN Tourism. I have recorded here some definitions from the IPCC, so the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Some also have been received by the International Standard, ISO. Uh, in, particularly, in particular, there is one that is so relevant for carbon neutrality that would be ISO 14068 part one. Um, so we talk about car carbon neutrality, net zero greenhouse gas emissions are recognized as uh, equivalent concepts. We talk about carbon footprint, that would be the sum of greenhouse gases emitted by a subject minus all the removals of, uh, of the subject as uh, in, in terms of the sinks that absorb and withdraw these greenhouse gases from the atmosphere. And then we have the other aspect that is offsetting, as Claudia was mentioning. So the, the residual part of what we cannot remove, what we cannot reduce, we might want to start considering options to offset outside of the boundaries of the subject that we're considering. And now I would like to spend a couple of moments to uh, address how climate change interacts with tourism, right? Why are we concerned as a tourism sector? And I will take uh, the angle of the coastal tourism or water-related tourism. I'm thinking sea level rises. Uh, this is something that is um, uh, addressing tourism directly because um, these increase in water levels not only determine some needs for uh, relocation for many of the communities that live close to the water that will eventually need most likely to be displaced and invest money to um, move somewhere else, to reconstruct their houses somewhere else, the infrastructure, but also it affects the health of the environment in the coast because 
um, these extreme weather events, the sea level rises, also increase the rate of coastal erosion. And that would lead to um, increased degradation of the coastal environment of the shoreline, which not only reduces the aesthetical and cultural value or recreational value, so this directly affects tourism, of course, but also the ecosystem services that the coastal ecosystems uh, deliver for us. Then I would like to mention also the effect that climate change and global warming have on uh, fauna and flora in the marine environment. There are changes in the distribution of the fauna. There are mass mortality events for uh, reefs. There are coral bleachings. And these will become more and more frequent as the effect of global warming unravel. Uh, so imagine all the activities like recreational fishing, recreational diving, also the production uh, of the ecosystems in terms of uh, the fishing reservoirs. This uh, will um, be affected massively by climate change, and we need to be um, mindful of this. And as well, the changes in global temperatures uh, will affect how we do tourism, because uh, think of beach goers. Uh, think of when you choose to go on holiday. Uh, is it too hot? Is it hot enough? So global temperature rises um, will have different effects based on the location determined, determined by the latitude, uh, so the distance from the equator. And I come from Italy, personally. I come from the Mediterranean um, climate. Imagine how hot it will become in the, in, in the classic summer season. At some point, the heat becomes unbearable, and uh, tourism will shift in terms of pattern. Accommodation, destinations will have to change the way they welcome the tourists, most likely also the period when they do so, uh, and will increasingly need to rely on shoulder months. So not in the core of the summer, most likely, but on the side of the summer, so to speak. Uh, whereas most likely uh, la higher latitudes will become more attractive during the summer, uh, and will welcome tourists in a different way. So the point that I'm trying to raise here is that um, there will be many, many challenges that come with climate change, increasingly so. There will be some opportunities as well, and the tourism sector needs to be ready to be anticipating these challenges and threats that happen to it, and need to respond in, a, in such a way that they can handle them using technology, nature-based solutions, changing their seasonal patterns to be ready to welcome them in the way they work. So as an organization, the Foundation for Environmental Education also has a strategy that was mentioned before, so uh, can I touch upon it. We, we, we have three pillars, three main pillars that we feel that we can have the most impact on, protecting global biodiversity, reducing environmental pollution, but I would like to uh, focus a little bit on empowering climate action. So. Um, in this presentation, what I hope to achieve is uh, some of these points that I'm listing here. So what we want to do is increasing climate change knowledge and awareness to drive impactful action. This is what I was mentioning before. Um, knowledge, awareness, education are pre-requirement for meaningful action to, uh, to face these challenges posed by uh, climate change. Support actions for climate resiliency. So we're talking about adaptation strategies here because climate change, as I was saying, is something of the present. And we are already starting to, to see the effect of climate change on tourist destination. And accelerating the transition to climate neutrality, which is exactly the point of this webinar today. Uh, we also take part in some global initiatives that I would really like to spend a couple of words about. Uh, I'm thinking, for example, the Glasgow Declaration for the Decarbonization of the Tourist Sector. This is an initiative led by UN Tourism, uh, together with other stakeholders. And uh, they align, of course, with the objectives that I was um, mentioning before. So halving emissions by 2030, reaching net zero as soon as possible before 2050. We are signatories of the Glasgow Declaration uh, for Climate Action and Tourism. And uh, we have developed as part of this, the Climate Action Plan, thinking of ways that we can contribute to this challenge and can help the tourist sector achieve these objectives that are quite ambitious. Um, the one of the merits that I think the Glasgow Declaration has is that it identifies 
pathways. So not only the problem, as Claudia was mentioning before, but also the strategy to get there, some solutions. So it lists some five pathways, uh, for example, measuring, decarbonizing, regenerating, financing, and collaborating uh, that are collections of actions that we can implement in order to get there, to, to reach the goals. Um, you will see in the slides that come, where I present some of the stories from the Blue Flag Network, that I touch upon some of these uh, pathways, um, because we really believe as a signatory of this um, declar Glasgow Declaration, that we have a role to uh, accompany the sites that are part of the Blue Flag Network um, to reach these, to, to accelerate this transition to climate neutrality. So the first example that I would like to present is an example of monitoring. And we're, so along with the presentation that Claudia was mentioning before, we need to start with a step which is understanding the issue, right? Understanding the context that we're working on. So this example comes from Brazil, in particular from the municipality of Guajá, and I really, really hope I, I'm pronouncing it right. <laughs> and uh, I think the power of this example is that it showcases the power of collaboration. Uh, we have the university, the Federal University of Sao Paulo, that started a collaboration with the municipality, and in particular with a, a technical school in the municipality of Guadalajara, uh, to collaborate with the kids uh, in the school and uh, implement uh, monitoring of sand quality, water quality, and using drones, also taking aerial pictures of uh, some 10 uh, beaches in the municipality to really start collecting data and analyzing the evolution of uh, sand and uh, coastal erosion. Uh, so in this way, they are understanding how climate change is affecting the surrounding environment, the coastal environment, the shoreline, and they can identify strategies to deal with this problem. Now, I think this is an incredible example of involving different stakeholders we have the site manager of the sites here that are also awarded the blue flag. We have the University of Sao Paulo. We have the technical school, the municipality, the local residents being constantly informed and taking part in these activities as well. We have an element of education here because these, get, these kids from the technical school will understand the problem, will become stewards of the society, of the environment that they live in as part of the community. So I think. Um, th this is really powerful in the sense that it showcases the, the, the component of integrated coastal management here. So th this is a partnership. So along the pathways of Glasgow Declaration, this would be totally a collaborating and a monitoring, measuring effort here to understand how climate change affects the environment here in Guadalajara. Then I would like to bring another example. Now we're moving to another context. We're moving to Bulgaria. Um, I have had the pleasure of visiting this beach as part of work as well. It's in Chernomorets, and it's very close to a camping uh, that shares the management of the beach. Uh, and I'm talking about reduction here. I'm super happy to hear in the presentation by Christopher that one uh, of the aspects that we want to focus on in tourism is coast green. Why is that? Because of course, it's quite difficult to imagine how a beach or a marina could have strong scope one emissions, right? Um, it's not like a factory, it's not like a manufacturing unit, right? Where we have uh, burning of fossil fuels and so, or quite limitedly so in a way. So in order to understand the hotspots here of the emissions, we really need to imagine what the activities of a destination like a beach are. And in this case, the beach managers, what they thought is, Let's focus on the purchasing and the procurement. So let's try to implement green procurement strategy in order to select materials, furniture, decor, um, even the infrastructure that is that needs to be there in such a way that we limit the emissions that happen upstream. So we are selecting materials like wood, rope that are organic. So they also act as um, sinks of this um, carbon that stays in the wood until it's burned. Um, and we do so in a way that integrates in a consistent way with the environment. Um, so I think this example is quite powerful because um, aesthetically, 
this is not a compromise. Uh, this works perfectly and blends in with the environment while having a particular attention for the materials that are used uh, to decorate the beach and to make the operations possible because we're talking sunbeds, we're talking um, pavilions, we're talking lifeguard towers. So I think there is a lot of power here in thinking about the ways we can, in our small context, reduce our emission. In this case, it's indirect emission because this is coke free, right? But this is still very, very strong. And lastly, I would like to present an example from Wales in the, in the field of carbon removal. So this is again an example of collaboration and partnership. And I, I, these are the ones that really inspire me because there are many people involved. It's, it's, uh, and I always wonder how they came to do this. It's, it's quite exciting for me. So in, in 2019, we have a group of volunteers uh, in Pembrokeshire uh, that together with the University of Swansea, they go to the British Isles, they collect one million feet from sea grasses, they bring them to the University of Swansea. These seeds are prepped in the laboratories of the University of Swansea, they're put in Hessian bags, and they are planted in front of the site of uh, Dale uh, in particular, which is one uh, awarded blue flag site. And uh, in this area, basically there was an environment for that was suitable for the growth of um, sea meadows. But historically, due to monitoring, so once again, understanding the problem is key to understand which actions we can implement. Uh, they saw that the amount of sea grasses there was uh, slightly reducing over time. So they, but, the, but the environment was fit for them to grow. So they planted this grass seed. And what I want to say is that this is so exciting because this is a nature-based solution. So it tackles many aspects at once. So we have carbon sinking here, and we have sea meadows as a very efficient way, as an alternative to forest in a way, to uh, capture this, uh, this carbon and really uh, use it to uh, foster growth of these plants that also work as sanctuaries for marine wildlife. So these are nurseries for fish species. Um, but not only that, because these also absorb a part of the kinetic energy of the waves. So they slow down coastal erosion. So I think the beautiful aspect of nature-based solutions in this case is that they really tackle multiple problems at once. And uh, I really appreciate when Christopher was saying, these problems are like biodiversity management, uh, climate action, these are not compartments that are isolated from one another, but they really overlap. And by tackling one, we need to think holistically how we can um, get low hanging fruits. So once again, I think the beautiful part, and, and I have to bonus that I think is a beautiful part of this best practice here, is that the civil society was involved here. So the volunteers going to collect these seeds under the supervision on the University of Swansea agreeing with the site managers of Dale to plant the seagrass. I think this is beautiful, imagining how all these stakeholders come together to find a solution to a problem that really say, I mean, is concerning everyone here. Nobody is a winner if we don't think of ways to contrast climate change in a way or to face the threats that it poses to us and exploit the opportunities that it creates. So, I understand that it was quite a, a lot here. So I just wanted to summarize and wrap up before I close um, and we leave the room for the Q&A. So uh, first of all, we have, and I hope it's clear to everyone, I'm sure maybe it was not even needed, but I, I wanted to say this, climate change is something that is urgent and is a problem of the present because we need to take action now. And this is not something of, future generations. This is something that is happening now and we need to take measures now. Sustainable tourism has a role, both as a recipient of the effect of climate change, but also as a proactive part contributing, as Christopher was showing, to reducing the emissions of greenhouse gases. So we have a role, both in the terms of adaptation for sure, but also in terms of mitigation. This is not a problem that a site manager can tackle alone, I would say. The complexity of the environmental issues is such that we really need to, to tackle it holistically 
And we need to Im start imagining that we need to pool resources involving stakeholders in the local communities, in civil society, corporate, academia. We really need to create networks that all together contribute to the solution of issues. And since I imagine that after these three points, you might be a little bit intimidated, you don't have to start from scratch. You don't need to reinvent the wheel. There are many good practices out there. There are many lessons learned that sites like the, the beaches, the marinas, the tourist boats of Blue Pike, the hotels, the hostels, the restaurants, the camping, uh, all these um, site managers that have been involved with sustainability so far, that have been putting a lot of hours of work, a lot of heads working on this, have developed some of these solutions. And of course, it might not as, be as easy as copy pasting them from one side to the other. We need to adapt them to the local context. But these are an incredible mine of ideas that can really contribute to the to the to the final uh, solution of the problem, right? Which is complex, but we are also many have thinking about this. So what can you do? I recommend that you stay up to date with the issues here and that you learn about the good practices that are out there so that you can start thinking of ideas that you can also implement in your area. I would also say, look around, because you're not alone in this, and you really need to learn about who is around you as a practitioner, who you can collaborate with. So who are the stakeholders around you that you can cooperate with, partner up with, to implement some of these complex solutions? Consider joining movement initiatives like the Glasgow Declaration, because they not only provide a pledge, but also strategies and tools for you to start addressing the problems, right? Because we were talking about the five pathways, right? There are some resources that you can really start using to think, what can I do concretely as a practitioner in tourism, right? And then I would say also keep joining us, uh, Fee, Blue Flag, Green Key, in the activities that we organize for this climate and campaign, because we will continue discussing uh, climate change. We will keep discussing climate action and hopefully we can give you some ideas or you can give us some ideas uh, to really keep working on this. So I really want to thank you for being here today, for your attention. It was such such a big pleasure for me uh, bringing these stories to you. Um, I feel very honored, to be honest, to, to tell these stories that uh, are so inspiring to me and I hope I managed to give them justice a little bit and I'm leaving here some QR codes for some of the activities that we have as part of the climate campaign. We have a quiz just for you to like learn a little bit about climate change and how it relates to tourism and so on. Um, it's uh, self-paced so no worries you can do it at your own time you know and it, we hope it's quite fun. <laughs> then we have the series of webinars. This is the first one of the series. We call it Climate Meet. And uh, we hope you will join us for the next episode as well. And then we have this sharing of good practices on our social media. Uh, so please, if you're interested about this, feel free to follow us and just uh, keep reading about these stories that are really inspiring from the network all over the world. Thank you once again. Thank you, Alessandro. That's amazing. The message that we are taking home is that because like only through collective action, collaboration, we can make a meaningful difference. And this, this is the meaning also we say of our theme, you know, working together. Today we are here, Green Key, uh, Blue Flag, we are with WTTC. It, it's working together for a more sustainable industry. It's about acting together and acting now and looking at the possibilities as Claudia and Alessandro were saying and as Christopher was showing, there are many possibilities. We can do so much. And we always need to keep a holistic approach. Sustainability is not only environmental sustainability. We have seen today the uh, social side, the relation between environment and communities. And, and then another thing that we have discovered is the importance of having a team that we can follow. If we just approach sustainability and, uh, and we want just to take the first step, for example, a verification scheme, uh, such as the hotel sustainability basis, 
could be an option, or if we are well advanced and we want to improve our uh, sustainability performance, why not to engage with green tea? Why not to engage with blue flag if we are mariners? And um, three supports. So now I will say I will leave the floor to all of you, and um, I will uh, start with the uh, Q and A session. But to do so, I will ask the, for the help of Joanne, uh, International Blue Flag Director. Joanne, thank you very much, Kara. Thank you to all our speakers, Chiara, for, for, for the facilitation, and of course, all our participants. I'm Joanne, I'm the International Director for the Blue Flag Program. I can see that our dear speakers uh, have already jumped in the chat to answer some of the questions. I would like to uh, reformulate one of the questions from uh, Kendra, if I'm correct. In few words, as simple as it could be for small accommodations, What, where would you recommend small accommodations to uh, go to a website, few names to start sharing their best practices and to be recognized or certified for their action. Claudia. I, I can go ahead um, and I think Christopher already started um, mentioning it. So basically um, the the project of the Hotel Sustainability Basics has been attempt, an attempt to also um, accommodate uh, small accommodations and help them on their, their process. At the same time, um, we from Green Key, we also certify small accommodation providers. So you can basically contact us and we will assist you in the process. Depending Depending on where you are um, at uh, in your sustainability journey, you would either go for the hotel sustainability basics because they are the idea to be the stepping stone towards then a certification program like Green Key. So long story short, write us an email and we can um, look into it in detail um, for you specifically and see where we can go with the process. Thank you very much, Claudia. Uh, Another question, if I'm correct, from Ian, uh, that was how to shed some light on the work uh, that tourists and guests can do. The discussions were very much uh, focused on the work on the hospitality sector actors, but how can you uh, promote an interest, incentivize guests and uh, users uh, down this path? Either Christopher or Claudia. Um, Can I? Oh, sorry, go Christopher. No, I, I think that probably we all have. Uh, I mean, this is a big subject. I mean, I think first of all, just in terms of you know, people who are tourists, I think they should behave sustainably, whether they are uh, you know living at home. Uh, uh, doing their usual day-to-day -day activities or being a tourist, right? There are just some activities that as a tourist perhaps fall outside of your usual activities. And there it's simply about conscious choices. And I think we can guess at most of those. But in terms of businesses, yeah, I think that businesses have a, um, a role now to play in encouraging uh, sustainable behavior. And I, I think that as much as possible, nudge you know there's a whole kind of uh, nudging theory try to 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 affect them through their wallets through their pride through making them feel good encourage them to make those sustainable choices as much as possible and also make those sustainable choices simple right you know tourists already need to figure out when they're traveling uh, what dates, what, uh, you know, means of transport, where they're going to stay, how much money they have. You know, if you're adding another layer of complexity on that and giving them more choices, it's going to be the last thing they look at, right? So just bundle it in as much as possible. Let's make them opt-out options rather than opt-in options. And again, nudge. If I can, if I can add to that, I would say, um, yeah, hundred percent agree to what Christopher said. And in addition to that, um, it should just be the part of the identity of your establishment. So it shouldn't be something that is something um, 
as Christopher said, that they opt in, opt out the tours. It's just the idea, and we do that at Green Key and Blue Flag, being part of the Foundation for Environmental Education. So involving the tourists, um, educating about what you do, but not as a teacher, um, um, uh, kind of like as a teacher that they don't want to think about in the, in the during the vacation, but more um, giving them, for example, opportunities to, to um, engage in community actions, fun, um, fun activities that they can contribute in in the destination that is also an experience for them in terms of um, during the vacation. So it's really involving them throughout your touristic product and making it an identity of your establishment. I wanted to bring the Blue Flag experience uh, as part of the criteria of the Blue Flag program that I work with. Uh, we asked the site managers to organize educational activities that involve the stakeholders that I was mentioning before, local communities, beach floors, marina users, uh, the people who are using the services of the tourist boat, so that they are also involved in learning actively uh, how the environmental phenomena affects the surrounding environment. And not only that, we asked the site to include information about the environment, natural sensitive areas, marine protected areas, and so on, along with code of conduct, so that they learn what the relevance of these natural environments are, about the species, because as Claudia mentioned before, we cannot want to protect something that we don't know. So first we need to learn about these things, we need to be taught about these things, and then we will become the stewards that the word requires us to be at this point. So I'm sorry for borrowing <laughs> the words from your presentation, but I think it's really important, this educational component in order to give responsibility to the tourists and to the beach goers and to the local communities and to the civil society in order for them to become proactive part. Thank you very much, Alessandro. I think we have time for uh, a couple of more questions. There was a very nice comment from from Ted uh, because climate action, this is definitely the right thing to do. Uh, and the vocabulary we use sometimes uh, is important, but may not resonate exactly where it hurts in the hospitality sector. Working on climate action, uh, and using potentially some business terms, what would be the advantages in regards to return on investment for hotel owners, uh, hotel operators, um, how to invest regarding climate action, adaptation or mitigation solutions potentially will help uh, be financially sustainable in the future as well, especially post-COVID. Do you think I can give a little bit of an insight there? Um, I come from a background of environmental economics. So it was exactly the, the, the joint point between uh, business and economics and environmental sciences. And I feel that along with the issue of climate change, uh, biodiversity loss, pollution reduction, and so on, there comes, especially in the case of climate change, I would say, an issue of risk reduction. Uh, when we talk about measures such as climate adaptation, we're also thinking of risk mitigation because these extreme weather events, sea level rises, all the problems that we have talked about during this presentation, during this webinar, are concrete probability, have a concrete probability attached to them to cause damage. And this would be, this would be the risk, right? The likelihood, times the damage in a way. And this can be monetized. The damage is a cost, right? For the business owner, for the hotel, for the destinations. I was mentioning ecosystem services that are hindered by this coastal erosion, by uh, uh, coral bleaching, by um, reef death, right? When we do not take action for this, we are not mitigating the risk. So we are accepting this cost even though it's an invisible cost, right? So when we take action to mitigate 
our emissions and to slow down global warming and to slow down ocean acidification or when we take action for adaptation so we do like uh, the site that I was presenting before Dale um, planting the sea meadows absorbing part of the kinetic energy of the waves so protecting the beach so all these things are avoided costs risk reduction when we lose width of the beach because of coastal erosion this is less people that we can accommodate that our destination can welcome so these are also costs that even though we don't see them now will affect us in the future so taking action now is a strategy in order to avoid these costs in the future i hope it makes sense Maybe I can add a few points. Uh, looking at the hospi hospitality sector, also a restaurant, uh, small accommodation, conference centers. I think we have all kinds of tourism establishments with, with us today. I would say, referring back to my presentation, it's really about you need to understand where do you have your resource, um, high uh, your areas with high resource uh, consumption. Um, where do I, for example, have areas with a high water consumption, energy consumption, and so forth, because that directly relates to the costs that you have. I can give an example from uh, one of our establishments that actually they, they did a little bit of tracking of um, of their their um, uh, energy consumption and they realized that in the winter months they suddenly had an incredibly increase of energy consumption in the staff rooms and then they, they realized that um, that is due to the fact that the staff is basically cold in the winter months uh, in the staff room and one of the actions that they implemented was invest in sweatshirts for the staff, um, which uh, dramatically decreased their energy consumption. So what I'm trying to say is you might have costs appearing that are related to areas that you're not aware of, um, where you can easily implement long-term solutions, um, thereby reducing your costs. So my suggestion would be, um, as mentioned before, do a tracking of the different area where you have high costs, and then you can implement the right actions to lower those costs. I, I would just add that, you know, uh, Alessandro was talking about adaptation versus mitigation, and, and with adaptation, you might see a more direct link between your investment and how you're perhaps offsetting your costs later on. But you might think with the mitigation elements, well, why should I be doing my bit if no one else is, right? because they might be more dispersed, the responsibility. Well, there you want to be thinking about, thinking, well, first of all, we should all be caring about the planet, right? But know that it, it, economics matters, finance matters. And and there there is this, you know, emerging and growing regulatory, all over the world. even if some of those regulatory mechanisms, such as the CSP in Europe, don't affect you because of the size that you are, you are part of the supply chains of businesses who are affected by it and who will be requiring data from you and evidence of sustainable performance. So this will quite directly affect your bottom line at some stage or another. So it is worth thinking about it now. Can I just add, I'm, I'm getting very excited by this, I'm sorry, but I need to add something. Tourism in particular understands that it's important to preserve the environment that it works with because the attractiveness and the recreational value and the aesthetic value of the places that we base our businesses on are the very resource that are, we are basing our businesses on. So if we lose the beach, if we lose the dunes, if we lose the coral reefs, if we lose the sea grasses, if we lose the fish that we go recreation diving, where is the business there? So I think in the, in the case of tourism, it is even more apparent how this becomes a concrete lost if we don't take action for this. Does that make sense? Thank you very much, yeah. Alessandro, Christopher, Claudia. Uh, we are reaching the end of, of the webinar. Uh, just one comment from one question from Denae Hines uh, regarding seagrass projects and carbon capture, num capture numbers. We don't have the time to go back into the details, but I do recommend to visit our website, uh, the Blue Flag website, and the post 2 project that we've been working on, Posidonia Oceanica, preserving uh, carbon sequestration uh, projects uh, around the Mediterranean Sea uh, and uh, the scientific uh, research uh, 
papers that are aligned with this uh, with this project. If you have any other comments, questions, please feel free to reach out uh, via email, the green key email, the blue flag email. You have everything on uh, on the uh, presentation on our website. I uh, thank you all. I will give back the floor to our dear facilitator. Excellent work. Thank you, Chiara. Thank you all. And I wish you a lovely afternoon. Thank you, Joan, and thank you, everyone, for being with us today, uh, 401, so it's a moment to say goodbye. Please reach out to us. We left all the details in the chat. Um, contact us, reach, reach to us. We are here to work together, and we wish you a very good day, and see you to the next webinar. Thank you. Thank you to our speakers. Thank you, Christopher. Thank you, Claudia, and thank you, Alessandro. Thank you so much.